Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. All he wanted was to be a Marine, and it cost him heavily. And yet he triumphed from the tragedy. Jacob Schick is a third generation combat Marine. He met Bradley Cooper on the set of American Sniper, and the two became friends. Tell me something, girl. So when Cooper started filming and directing A Star Is Born, he needed a last minute tough guy to play Lady Gaga's mean boss. So I got there and Bradley goes, listen, I need you to do that Marine guttural yell. I've heard you do it, and that's what I want you to do. And I was like, bro, are you sure? Like, are you sure that's what you want me to do? Because then he's like, yes. And he did it effortlessly. Seen here on set, where after a couple days of yelling at Lady Gaga, she gave him a supportive send off. It was her that said, hey, everybody, let's give a big round of applause for Jake and all of his hard work. Thank you guys, because I had to rush off and get back to Texas to go to an event. And she did that. You know, that's what humble leadership looks like. Oh, all right. This interview uh, is very special to me today because when I met Jacob, he prefers Jake. When I met Jake and heard all of the back stories of, of his experiences, it was hard to decide where I would start. And so we're just going to start. And as I welcome Jake, I, I just want you to know that it started when his grandfather and uncle were in the Marines, and so Jake enlisted in high school. In fact, at the beginning of his senior year. And then just four years later, he was deployed to Iraq. It was there that he learned what the Brotherhood was really about. And then the morning came that Jake and his team got a reaction call. Jake, I'm so glad you're on the show today. Honored and privileged to be here, Valerie. Thank you. You're welcome. That, um, that reaction call, I'd never heard of reaction call. What does that mean and, and what happened that morning? The REACT team is a group usually of around 10 Marines that sole job is to neutralize any threat in the area of operation that we're operating in. And so when there would be a REACT call, it was our job to go neutralize the threat and make sure the area of operation was clear of anyone that we did not want in the area or anything. And so that morning it was called uh, very early before sunup and I just had a bad feeling about it. And so I took some, took some actions that I otherwise wouldn't have taken just because of the bad feeling that I had. Hmm. And whether it's my grandfather speaking to me from beyond the grave or you know God or whatever it is, uh, I took the bomb blanket out of my commanding officer's home V and put it in the lead vehicle, kicked the driver out of the driver's seat, took the radio from the radio man and got in the driver's seat, made all the guys button up and meaning if the government gave it to you for protection, put it on now. And what was it you were wanting to take with you that you're... So the, we only had one bomb blanket. And bomb blanket, okay. It's basically a Kevlar blanket, and our commanding officer had one in his Humvee in the passenger seat. Okay. And I knew that was the only one that we had access to, so something told me to grab it, which I did. And then I put the neck, told the guys, you know, button up, meaning put on their neck protectors, groin protectors, flak jackets, make sure their sappy plates were in, inside the flak jackets. Kevlar helmets, et cetera, et cetera, and shatterproof goggles, which ended, turns out they're not shatterproof. Mm. And then I got in the driver's seat and I punched it, and within three minutes we hit a triple stack tank mine that was pressure plate ignited. As soon as the front left tire made contact with the plate, the plate goes down, lights a fuse, bomb goes off. And so oh. it essentially blew up directly beneath me and blew me around 30 feet through the top of the Humvee 
And I ended up s- sticking the landing with my head because I'm a Marine and we believe in good form. And so uh, <laughs> that was a, that was a long day at the office. You know, it took 42 minutes for the Black Hawk to come and get me because they were all dispatched in 2004, especially in the Sunni Triangle was a very busy time. And so that was a long day at work. But I'm I'm very grateful that I was alert and aware that that entire time because I got to tell those those men, those Marines, those brothers of mine, how much I love them and how much they mean to me, and that they're gonna have to go on and fight for me. You know, I can't fight anymore. And that was uh, when that bird took off. That was probably the hardest part of all of it for me when I was leaving them. That's uh, not probably. That was the hardest part of all of it. And here you were. You didn't. You never lost consciousness, mm-hmm. and during that time, and you were talking to the brotherhood. Absolutely, it was. Um, you know, the only thing that wasn't broken or crushed was my right arm, and so they laid me in the back of the second vehicle and took me back up to the command post where we had just left, and that's where Doc started working on me, and the guys, you know, the Marines were trying to help out, help Doc as much as they could, and. And every one of them got in the driver's seat of the hum, the second Humvee, and we held hands, my, my right hand on one of their hands, and you know had a little conversation, a little heart to heart with every one, one of them individually, and then collectively, and that's when the bird came in and got me, and uh, they loaded me up on the Black Hawk, and that was it. I didn't see him for a few months, till till they all came home a few months later, by the grace of God. So, um, tell us then the beginning of the fight, the recovery. You know, as soon as we landed in Balad, which is the, uh, it, at the time was nothing more than a, a field hospital right near Baghdad, and as soon as we landed there, it started to hit me very quickly how serious this was, and that I was by no means out of the woods. And I ended up having my right foot amputated in Balad because my right foot was crushed, so there was no blood flow. So my right foot was dead by the time we got there. And I remember after I woke up from the operation, Nurse Jax told me what had happened and told me that they had to amputate and that I was really wounded, which I already knew from do- doing my self-assessment before the guys got to me. Mm. And then she said, you know, is there anyone you'd like to call? Which, of course, I I wanted to call people. And then that's when I used the satellite phone to call my father and let him know that, you know, they got me. And I was was hurt. And uh, I remember my dad saying, are you going to make it? And I said, I don't know. And there was a big pause. And he said, all right, well, you know, we'll see you in Germany. And I remember just saying, please hurry. Hmm. I ended up turning into like a little kid at that sure. moment that just needed my dad, you know, and mm-hmm. it was, um, I knew then that this was going to be a long road that, that if I was going to make it, it wasn't going to be easy and it was by no means easy, but you know, just the love and support of the people around me and my family and my friends and all the people that worked on me and all the people that worked with me, you know, so I think, well, the large part of why I'm here today or as my grandmother told me the first time she saw me in the hospital she said well baby I guess God doesn't want you and the devil won't have you (laughs) (laughs) you're something else you can bring humor to to all of this already (laughs) and you did when we first met too humor can help can't it Mm -hmm. so Jake you um, the road to healing you were you were in the hospital for how long uh right at 18 months i was in the hospital did three months in uh right about three months in bethesda maryland and at the national naval hospital up in bethesda and then did about 15 at brook army medical center in san antonio so all told around 18 months at the end of that time where did where did your um healing internally began it didn't for a while um i think i liked to trick myself into thinking that it was Hmm. 
but it wasn't. I was, I was a drug addict when I got released from the hospital, and it wasn't anybody's fault. It was just you can't go through that many operations. I mean, I had over 50 operations, over 20 blood transfusions. The majority of those operations were very invasive operations, and so I'd have to be put under for several hours, at times up to 18 hours at a time. Hmm. And everybody's body reacts differently to medication, and unfortunately my body fought it. My body did not want to allow the painkillers to do what they were designed to do. And so it took more and more and more. And by the time I got out, it was, um, I was heavily addicted to opiates. And so uh, that's how I reintegrated back into society, even before I retired from the Marine Corps medically. Of course, I, I just, I was high. I was just chasing my first high. And, you know, because as long as I was numb, nothing mattered. Mm hmm. And so that's the way I lived for quite some time until you know, I realized that that wasn't going to do it. And so that's when I decided to to do the work to get clean, and and that's what I did. And uh, I ended up calling my my lead physician <laughs> back in San Antonio, and I said, "Hey, man, good news! I'm getting off all the drugs." And about around this time, I was taking around 55 pills three times a day and eating. 55. Yes. I, Three I was, times a day. I was a drug addict in every sense of the words. And she said, uh, she said okay, great, Jake, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, I'm just not going to take my first dose. I'm just going to quit. She said, well, I'd highly advise against that. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, because if you do it that way, you're going to have a massive heart attack and die. And I said, Roger that. Plan A's a no-go. What's plan B look like? And she said, you're going to have to come back to San Antonio and we're going to have to wean you off the drugs, which is not what I wanted to hear because I did not want to go back to that hospital. and But I did, and because of my stubbornness, I ended up getting off the drugs several months before I was supposed to, and I didn't necessarily abide by their plan of action and the way they wanted to carry it out, and so it was not rapid enough for me. So I ended up locking myself in the guest house across the street from the hospital and uh, for about 12 or 14 days, and I was just violently ill for 12 to 14 days and but then I woke up after that you know 13th 14th day whatever it was and took a shower and it was like nothing ever happened but that's why I can sit here and say with conviction I, I know why drug addicts stay drug addicts because that I had never been that sick in my life and when people ask me what was the worst part physically all of it from mm -hmm. beginning to end mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if it was coming off the drugs or actually getting blown up I don't know what was worse I would have to think about it for some time. Oh, Jake. So here you are today. Mm. And um, <laughs> you talked to me about not only the pain and the, um, the trauma that you went through and getting off the drugs, but you also talked about the suicide effect of of vets when they come home mm -hmm. and now you're very heavily involved with that tell us about that i am you know here's the thing is for me i i think a majority of us uh just through my work in this in this realm and knowing some of the guys i know and, and women that i know that wore the cloth of the nation i really think that we we embody and harness tr trauma from our childhood and I think it happens long before we ever don a uniform. And what I think happens is we put on that uniform, whether deployed or not, whether combat or not, mm -hmm. those, those demons and that trauma that you already have are exacerbated through various situations in the military, first responders, you know, law enforcement officers, firefighter, paramedic EMTs. And so for me, I think it's you already have those demons there that you that go unaddressed for whatever reason. Mainly, I think because of fear of judgment, for even asking for help. Hmm. And so for me, I, I I struggled with depression and anxiety and hypervigilance and suicidal ideation, and I'm very fortunate that I never carried out any of those thoughts. And I knew that I needed to change. I needed to do something to feed my soul in order to grow forward, in order to help the men and women that feel like they can't help themselves because 
it's showing weakness. And they a, think. Right. When in all actuality, it's absolutely the strong thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I did a speaking engagement for my grandmother that, because she asked me to do it, which is the same as telling me to do something and, you know, and says no to the grandmother. No, you don't. And I remember I went and spoke to her Rotary Club, and I was <laughs> far and wide the youngest person in the room. And I remember I got done, and I walked out of the back of the clubhouse. And I walked out back, and it was terrible. It was a horrible speaking engagement. It was just poorly executed, poorly delivered. Everything was terrible. But I remember I walked out, my grandmother walked outside, and she put her hand on my back and she looked at me and she said, how do you feel? And I said, um, actually, I, I feel a little lighter. Like, my hmm. soul's a little lighter. Because you had told your story right. for the first, first time. time. First time. First time. Grandmother's and, wisdom. And she looked at me and she winked and she said, okay, mission accomplished. And I said, got it. And then uh, you know, that led to another d speaking engagement, led to another one and then another one and another one. And... And then that's when I realized, okay, it's this is therapy for me. It's mm. very therapeutic, and and that led to you know a whole different host of things, which has got me where I am now, leading this organization that fights uh, not only suicide, but we we prevent suicide through empowerment, through traditional and non-traditional treatment and training, and that's this. Path, that's 22 right? kill. Hold that up. Yes, it is 22 that's, kill. That's quite a name. So, that's the what point. does it mean? That's the point. It, yeah. it just means it means okay. The, the study, VA did a study, conducted a study in 2012 that stated on average 22 veterans die by suicide every day. Every so, day. Wow. Hence the number 22. Well, kill because suicide is an act. Mm -hmm. It is. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You you are terminating a life albeit your own you're killing yourself and so of course now we say die by suicide and uh, but that's the name the 22 kill the mask represents that we all wake up and put on a mask go to the office change the mask go to a lunch meeting change the mask back to the office whole yes. different mask go home whole another mask yes and our thing is wake up and do you everyone else is taken <laughs> unapologetically be yourself uh -huh. because you only get one shot you know we're all fundamentally flawed and just accept it acceptance of the is accept that and move forward and so we've been hard at this for many years and we were grateful to have the 22 push-up challenge that we started in 2013 go viral in 2015-16 time frame and and we were able to really capitalize on a lot of momentum from that what is it it was the push-up challenge that uh, went viral actually after the rock did it and which kind of irritated me because we had <laughs> tens of thousands of people do it before him. Ah. And then, of course, he did it, and then it went viral. And I was kind of, I remember getting the phone call, and I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. I was actually doing a fishing show in uh, Florida off Captiva Island. And I remember I got the phone call, and it annoyed me. <laughs> they said, oh, it's gone viral. <laughs> and I was just remember being annoyed because I was like, man, why does it take that? Uh -huh. for it to catch on because the whole idea behind the push-up challenge was just to show that there was a problem it was never meant to be to garner any monetary gain that mm -hmm. was never intended for that it was mm -hmm. intended that hey look our brothers and sisters are dying at the rapid rate and we need people to know this is a problem let's do it this way let's utilize the power of social media to start this campaign that will then create awareness and of course, ever since then, we've evolved into a full-blown treatment organization, and we do, everything we do is centered completely around mental wellness. And so, we've learned a lot. We still are learning every day. Mm -hmm. Every day, we learn something new, and we've realized that um, all we have to do every day in this organization is show up and be present with compassion, absent of comparison, and that's and the rest will take care of itself. You know, right things, right reasons, and everything else will take care of itself course there's hard days like everybody sure. everybody has them and we have challenging times and we've uh, we've lost several people that we've worked with for some for years and it's it's part of the unfortunately it is part of this evolution in in feeding the human soul it's by no means easy and that's why I love that tribe I, I love I love 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 
the men and women that work in this organization that cannot be measured because I get to see these men and women love without boundaries, mm. knowing that at any given moment they're going to be hurt. And it's because of the courage and the way that they love that I love and admire and respect every single one of them. What a story and what an involvement to be in that's making such a difference. And you were found out by Hollywood. I think this is pretty clever. So we're going to show you a couple of pictures coming up here. Um, One of them is with Bradley Cooper. Tell us about being in the movie A Star is Born. Yeah, so Bradley actually is... uh very good friend of mine and we met on the set of American Sniper and since then that's actually that's me shooting on air quotes the (laughs) range uh, on American Sniper that was actually at Disney Ranch that's my good friend next to me that was the spotter but we um, we stayed in touch and he needed um, really it was like a last minute favor for this role and he, he said, uh, hey, I need a favor. You're just going to, you know, I'm shooting the movie we talked about when we did the Ellen show, and I don't have time to fill the role. You'd be perfect for it. We do it. And I, was, I said, well, you know, well, Bradley, I need to know what it is. <laughs> what is it? You know, and because, um, you know, it's Hollywood. It's and Hollywood. So, <laughs> and he told me, and uh, I said, well, yeah, I'll do that. And um, then I got there. Well, clearly he didn't tell Lady Gaga what, exactly what he told me. And. It was interesting the first take when I yelled at her, and she, she was a little startled by it. But <laughs> what what did you have to do? Those so who, it, who was, it was essentially the it was essentially me telling her it was her turn. To, I was her boss. I played her, her boss. boss. I was a catering manager and in this commercial kitchen, and it was her turn to take the trash out. Clearly, she did not want to take the trash out, <laughs> and I ended up. Um, that yeah, pretty much just yelled at her for a couple of days because you know you, if you shoot one great take you have to do it 500 more times <laughs> and so uh, but she was one of the most gracious kind people I've ever met she was um, she is an unbelievably good person that I'm, I'm really really honored and privileged to say I got to work with her because she is just uh, she's one of those magnetic souls that you know you they, they that leaves you curious mm. and, and and that's absolutely a compliment that's yeah. nice to hear i hope she's watching and if not we're going to send her the tape <laughs> right you send it to her yeah. you know you talk about uh you, i loved the comments you made when we met about soul speaking of feeding mm-hmm. your soul soul feeders and soul bleeders mm-hmm. i loved that description now take it to what you meant about it sure so it's it's another way essentially of saying that when we wake up every day we have two choices you're either going to be a, a victim or you're going to be a victor it's our choice mm-hmm. no one gets to tell us which one we are mm-hmm. it's our choice i mean that's the beauty of living in a free society i mean we have the ability to be and do whatever we want within the confines mm-hmm. of the law mm-hmm. and i like to say you know, every day you wake up, you're either a soul feeder or a soul bleeder. Choose wisely, because <laughs> you only get one shot at this thing called life. And the soul feeder is the person that loves all the way, without boundaries, and loves himself enough to receive the same love. Soul bleeder is someone that is the antithesis of that. Someone that finds the drama in everything. Someone mm. that has to be drama driven in order to get through the day. Someone that wants to talk about everyone but themselves. And those are the people that have not figured out a way to forgive themselves and love themselves purely and authentically. And I feel like that those are the people that need the most help. Those are the people that need to look in the mirror and be in love with the person looking back at them. Because at the end of the day, that's where our lives begin and end. How do we feel about the person looking back at us in the mirror? You have to have that self-love all the way first before you're any good to anyone around you. And that's just the way it is. I didn't create that. It's by design. And we need to get people okay with that. We need to get people 
to understand that they're they're worth living well. Mm. That, that is the only way to truly honor the people that have come before us, those that are going to come after us, family members, friends, service personnel, otherwise you have to live well. That's the only way to honor them. That sounds so wonderful. And in reality, we both know that in the business world also, mm. uh, it's hard to look in the mirror and say, I love you mm. and really mean it. Mm -hmm. So give us some tips. First of all, take off the mask because you're not going to fool yourself forever. <laughs> you know, we're masters of that, though. We're masters yeah. of talking ourselves into the fact that reality is not reality. And we are masters of manipulating ourselves. Which in turn, by default, makes a lot of us master manipulators of other people. Other people. Mm -hmm. And so f for us, it's just wake up and be you. Just be you. Because when you pass and people have your funeral or your wake or what have you, there's going to be a group of people there that love you unconditionally. There's going to be a group that probably don't care that you've passed and you have zero control over either group. And Very that's wise. the thing. That's the thing is that we have to stop acting as if we have control of everything around us because you don't mm -hmm. we, you do you have no control so I tell the tribe all the time if we're planning a big event or you know one of our multiple big events that we do every year regardless of what state it's in or what we have going on I just say everybody calm down absolutely nothing's under control just calm down yeah. you have Chill. control over what's looking at you in the mirror mm -hmm. and that's where it stops that's just that's just uh, so empowering and authentic. Mm -hmm. And so what would you do with someone who said to me recently, you know, Valerie, I can't be authentic. I, you, this all sounds really good, but uh, I have a job and I have to act a certain way. I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. Now, I mm -hmm. won't tell you what I said to him or her, because it could be both, and it has been both. Mm. In all seriousness, 50% mm -hmm. of people who work today do not come into the workplace just totally who they are. And, and rightly so. I mean, you, it, things are situational. You're a boss, and you have to have rules and so forth. You can't be buddy-buddy with everyone. I understand that. But let's get to the crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. Looking at yourself in the mirror and really if you don't already, really beginning to appreciate, that's what you're saying, really appreciate the you, the wonderfulness of you made in the image of God. How do you do that at work? Because now you're a businessman. Mm -hmm. And I've been told you're a very good businessman and you're a good boss. <laughs> so now you're on this side of the ledger. Yeah, I'll tell you, quite frankly, um, it's good news about me is that I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to be very direct because I'm living on borrowed time and I realize that and so I don't have time to BS anybody. What I did, which was a, a huge release for me, mm -hmm. and it was very freeing, is that I accepted that there was nothing special about my own pain and suffering. Wow. And I believe whether it's a boss or a dad or a husband or son brother uncle etc 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 you have to accept there's nothing special about your own pain and suffering you have to accept your humanity you have to accept your flawedness you have to accept how you are designed the way are you you are designed the way you look <laughs> and that's the way it is uh -huh. in that you either are gonna make the most of that and be a soul feeder or you were going to hang on to this victimization and this victim mentality and you were going to be a soul bleeder. And everything around you is going to be exactly what you think. But it's on either side. That's why I, I would always tell people, I've told the 22 Kill Tribe, I've told thousands and thousands and thousands of people, I'm very candid and open when I'm speaking publicly, that you know, whether I'm on the high road and on the path of righteousness or I'm on the low road and the path of if there's a law I'm gonna break it it's one hell of a show either way 
Mm-hmm. It's one. It's a show either way because I suck at doing stuff halfway. But it's like I tell the tribe, hey, listen, just do it all the way and don't allow the fear of failure to dictate your greatness. Don't allow yourself to fall into the crux of if you are living a, a according according to societal expectation that you're 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 not going to achieve greatness or you will achieve you do not have to placate the societal expectation in mm-hmm. order to achieve greatness mm-hmm. do you mm-hmm. be true to yourself no one knows you better than you you have to start by forgiving yourself you have to love yourself That's not only appreciate one. yourself you have to love yourself all the way and truly believe you are worthy of said love you have to in order to do anything for anyone else around you and it's just the way it is that's how (laughs) that's i tell the tribe all the time i tell audiences this all over the globe i believe we were born with two objectives every single person regardless of what corner of the earth you're from regardless of socioeconomic status regardless of any of it i believe every single bipod is born with two objectives to love and be loved everything in between is filler everything in between doesn't matter it is how much are you willing to love and do you truly believe that you are worth the same love Mm -hmm. because those two things together are what we're all after i believe it's what god intended knowing that we were going to mess it up (laughs) because we're humans and that's what we do and that's okay Mm -hmm. it is okay to fail it is okay to have a bad day it is okay to not be okay that's a big one it's okay to not be okay it's okay Mm -hmm. it's okay post-traumatic stress is nothing more than a abnormal uh, 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 excuse me a normal reaction to an otherwise abnormal situation. That's right. It's completely normal. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that it's okay to not be okay. Regardless of if I'm talking to 50 people in the audience or 5,000. And you are. When I ask them, how many people just show of hands at the beginning of uh, of a speaking engagement, how many people just show of hands have ever suffered from uh, depression, anxiety, hypervigilance, suicidal ideation, alcoholism, addiction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, just show of hands. But at the very beginning, you have maybe you know a very, very conservative number of hands go up. Uh-huh. Like ooh. Right, and it's very quick. Yep. Because they don't want to expose themselves mm-hmm. because of the fear of judgment. Oh, who's going to see? Who am mm-hmm. I going to be judged by? Mm-hmm. And then by the time I'm done and I ask the same question even after question and answer the question and answer phase of the engagement i'll ask the same question at least 99 percent of the hands go up and then for the one percent always say hey for all of the all of you that rose your hand and you owned it Uh had ownership and accountability thank you that's courage yeah and for those of you that didn't don't worry we all know you know you're full of crap (laughs) because it's true it's true and it's okay Okay. And Jake, if you here's the deal. If you who have been through all of this and there's so much more deeper that the audience can learn about should they choose to Google you, uh, <laughs> if you can do this, here's the deal. If you can do this, yeah. I can do this. If you can get through that, I can get through that. Absolutely. I mean, y- you are being given a platform to make a huge difference. And um The thing that I want to leave the audience with is just to say, if you meet a soldier, we talked about this, Mm. in the airport or walking down the street, we talked about earlier, and I want to share this with you listeners, the typical thing to say. There's a story behind that with you Mm -hmm. walking into a 7-Eleven store Please share the story and give us better something to say other than thank you for your service. So sure. tell that story, please. Sure. So we, I'd been out with some friends that night. We'd been celebrating something, and we would uh, we went at Seven Eleven to grab some water and or whatever we grabbed, and we were leaving, and there was a a homeless 
gentleman that was standing outside and you know my my buddies kind of br- brushed him off acted as if you know he kind of wasn't there and something that we've all done and and um i just i just couldn't walk by him without acknowledging him because it was i don't know at the time i just felt like i needed to acknowledge this guy and so i i went to hand him a, a 20 dollar bill and he went to grab it and i hung on to it hmm. and i didn't let him grab it and he looked at me and he started he, he started saying, oh thank you thank you I, oh you know bless you and i, I grabbed it and he just kind of looked at me and i said you know you're worth it you're worth it you know you're worth it and he he got very emotional and um i hugged him and and uh and i said look i know what you're about to go spend this money on hmm but you don't have to you're worth living well and um you know, he got very emotional and you know, it it was a it was a moment you know we had a moment and uh connecting you went back to my buddies and that's when we we, you know we left but that was the beginning of of a that's what i would tell i that's what i tell people to this day that thank me for my service i say you're worth it even though i think most people do it for their checkbox it's their inner checkbox of i did my good deed for the day i said thank you for your service in other words Right, and so my thing is, if you really want to thank someone for their service, you should quickly follow it up with, is there anything me or my family can do for you? And you will say? Yeah, I will will say... You've got three things, right? That's it. (laughs) And it sounds generic, but it's not. Be willing to give it some thought. We We all have three things of value, some more than others but we all possess three things of value time talent and treasure time talent and treasure if you're not okay. willing to sacrifice some of one of those three things mm-hmm. you don't want to help you're talking mm-hmm. checking so the box it's gut check time mm-hmm. what do you really want to do because you cannot have service service without sacrifice they're synonymous well wow. So many lessons, so many wonderful things that you are being given the opportunity now to do and to mm. make a difference in in so many people's lives. Is there one thing that you would, in final statement, say to the audience about life, advice, whatever? What would it be? It would be, man, that's... <laughs> makes it hard when you're you're hit with the that question it's the one thing live a life worth writing about Mm. wow because for me it's um our legacies only truly die the last time our story's told Mm. so be worth writing about live Mm. that way Wow. I can't say much more after that, except (laughs) God bless you. Thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You talk about somebody real and authentic, and this is the guy. So thanks for listening. Share this podcast. You better, okay? Mm -hmm. God bless you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, for those of you who are watching, thanks for doing so. And I mean that. Share this. There's a lot of people out there that can learn and hear maybe from deep within their heart something they need to hear that this young man has said today and so until next time (laughs) guess what i'm gonna say stay authentic bye for now thanks for listening to receive valerie's voice free monthly leadership tips and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching visit her website valerieandcompany.com next week we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.